record. Okay, now we're recording. Okay, so again, uh, uh, from the textbook, I'm going to start with the chapter uh, exercises for uh, distribution of random variables, and we're going to start with normal distribution. So I'm going to take a look at this first problem. Area under the curve, part one. What percentage of a standard normal distribution, okay, P, oh, and now standard normal distribution is the normal distribution where the mean is equal to zero and the standard deviation is, is equal to one. It's kind of the version of the normal distribution that the Z table is based on. Okay, so let's take a look at what these uh, various Z scores represent. So we have a Z score of minus 1.35, Z score of greater than, less than one, minus 1.35, greater than 1.48, um, uh, less than 0.4, or between, uh, but greater than, excuse me, uh, 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 greater than point, oh, point, negative 0.4, but less than uh, 1.5, and then finally a z-score of a positive value greater than 2. Okay, so we're going to take a look at those. First, let me get my graphics pad out, and I want to draw this to start off with. Okay, so what does the standard normal distribution look like? Okay. Okay, so here's our normal distribution. Whoops. Okay, here's our normal distribution. And our normal distribution has a series of properties that we can rely on. If it is truly a norm, normally distributed population, right, our, our normal distribution is going to be bell-shaped. It's going to taper out as it goes out. Okay, and the area under the curve is going to be reduced the further away we are from the middle. Okay, this is going to represent uh, everybody in a population and re represent the probabilities of people having certain values in a population and so on and so forth. Now, the standard normal distribution, right, is the one that the Z table is built on. Okay, and that's one that's built up from the formula for the normal distribution. But it assumes that the mean is equal to zero and the standard deviation is equal to one. So sigma is equal to one and mu is equal to zero. Okay, so in, a, in essence, the z score is the same as the value x. In other words, uh, the, value, the value for x is equal to negative one is one to the left of the uh, mean, which is a z score of negative one. That's basically why it's the standard normal distribution. It's a way of calculating the areas that are represented by various z-scores. So the first z-score that we're interested in is the z-score for the value z is less than minus 1.35. Minus 1.35, it's going to be around here somewhere. Okay, so this location represents a z-score equal to negative 1.35. And we're interested in the area that's less than that, or the area to the left of it. So we want to know what the area of this part of a normal distribution would be. Okay. So in order to figure that out, I can do it two ways. I can go to the standard normal dis table for the standard normal distribution, or I can use my Excel. So I'm going to use my table for starters. Okay. There's my uh, let's see Z table. Oops, there we go. Okay, first thing I want to look at is I note that the graphic tells me what area is represented by the Z value I'm going to look up. So I can see that the area that's represented when I look up the Z score in this particular table is the area that's shaded. It's the area to the left or less than that Z value, which is exactly what we want in this case. So I'm going to look up the, Z, the area that's represented by a z-score less than 1.34, was it, or 3.5? Less than 1.35. 1.3, and to find the third digit, we go across 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So the area to the left of that, that grayed out area, is 0 0.885. So I'm going to make a note of that. 
whoops, this area represents 0 0.0885. Well, this number is a proportion. If I look at this entire area, this entire uh, distribution as a probability of one, all the possible outcomes, this represents 0 .0, uh, 0.0885 parts of that. Uh, uh, 0.08% of that or 8.85% or of that. So I could look at it that way or I could look at it as, uh, as a percentage. This represents 100% of a population as a percentage, which represents 8.85% of a population. So this area can represent a probability, can represent a proportion of a population, uh, can re represent the number of people, of the uh, 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 part of the population that has a value, a uh, z-score less than this value. Now notice it said uh, z less than 1.35. Okay, uh, don't worry about the idea that it's less than in this case, because the value 1.35 is a straight line. Straight lines have no area. If you have a, if you have a rectangle, we know that the area is x times y, right? But there, there's no x here on the line. It just has no dimension. So it has no area. So it doesn't matter whether you look at this including 1.35 or not including 1.35. Just look for 1.35, figure out what the area to the left of that is. Okay, so let's take a look at the next question that they ask about this standard normal distribution. Uh, what is the area that's greater than 1.48? Okay, so where's 1.48 going to be located? Well, 1.48 is going to be located approximately, oops, approximately, let's say about here. All right, so this is going to be a z-score of plus 1.48. Okay, so are they looking for the area greater than that or less than that? In other words, to the left or to the right. Look at the area that's greater than that. Okay, so in other words, they're looking for this area in here. So what is that area going to be? Okay, we can use our Z table again. Okay, let's take a look at our Z table. Our Z table says, let's see, where is it? Uh, 1.48 is a positive number. So a positive number is going to be on the left side of the standard normal distribution. In other words, zero is the middle. To the left side is positive z-scores, right? The mean is in the middle, and then anything that's a z-score that's a positive number is to the right. So if you're looking at the area to the left, which is what our table gives you, it's always going to be more than 50%, because it's always going to include everything from the mean down and then some extra. So this is always going to be greater than 50% if it has a positive number, at least in the area to the left of that. Okay, so let's look up 1.48. 1 1.4, 1, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 is 0 0.9306. Okay, let's fill that in. So this area is equal to 0 0.09306. Uh, oops. I'm sorry, 0 0.9306. 0 0.9306. In other words, this is not this area, right? Not that area. This represents the area from this point down from that z score, right? So, to, in order to calculate what this area is, we have to take that value and subtract it from 1. Okay, that's going to be 4, uh, let's see, one, nine, okay, 9, 6, uh, 0, 0. 0. 0.694, okay, so, so let's see, so that's, that, that represents, the value greater than represents 0. 0.0694. Okay, so now, if that's the case, um, uh, 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 our answer is 6.94% or 0 
0.694. That's the area that's represented here. My table only worked the other direction, so I had to accommodate for that. And I see one of you is having a problem. Okay. And Angelia, you know you can use the workstations uh, in the uh, lab. If you go down to C09, I'm sure nobody's using uh, the workstations. So you can use the computers down there. Is that, a, is that an option for you? Oh, my goodness. Uh, um, you know, go, if, if you go to the library, if you go to the library, they will log you on. Let them know that you can't get in there, and they will log you on. Okay, that's where the tech support is. If you go into the entrance to the library, the guys just to the right there are tech support for the uh, um, uh, for the lab. Okay, good, excellent. I'm sure I'm sure they'll help you out. They're very cooperative. Okay, so that's where we stand there. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you guys to do two things. One is find find the area represented by a z score less than 0.04. And by a z score greater than 1.5. Okay? Okay, so I'm gonna give you guys five five minutes or so to do that calculations. Two calculations. Do a calculation first for z less than 0.04, and then for z score less than 1.5. And then we're actually gonna use that. That's not gonna be the answer to this question, but we're those are things that we need to use. You need to be able to look up the areas that those represent the area for less than 0.04 and the area for less than 1.5. So you guys look that up and then uh, in five minutes, I'm gonna pause the recording in five minutes, we'll come back and, and we'll go over the answer to that question. Okay, so I want you guys to give that a try for me. Okay, and I'll leave this up here. I think I'll pause, if I pause recording, it will continue to allow you to see the screen. So I'm going to pause and then give you five minutes. Recording. And so do I have any opinions on what that what those areas are? I'm going to open up a new sheet for myself. OK. Here's our normal distribution, standard normal distribution. Our mean is zero, and this is a z-score of negative 0.4. And the other side was a z-score of, let's see, problem again, uh, plus 1.5. Okay, that over here somewhere, plus 1.5. Okay, and these are z-scores, right? They're not actual values, they're z-scores. Okay, good. Anybody want to uh, give me a little bit of a, uh, some feedback? What's the area that's less than negative 0.4? This area here. Okay, 0.3446. Let's check that on our, uh, on our, uh, uh, on our table. Negative 0.4. Negative 0 .40, 0 0.3446, excellent, good. Okay, what about the positive 1.5? What area is below that? Plus 1.5. Okay, where's our C-score for that? Any takers there? 1.50 x okay well hang on a second i got a 0.6687 well let's see 1.5 would be 1.5 i think you know i think what happened there is is that you you actually looked up 1.05 and 1.05 well no, not even that let's see 60 point six six eight point six six point six 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 eight oh seven. Um, that must have come from the, from I guess you must have used the Z, uh, Excel to calculate that. Ange, one minus point point nine three three. Oh, I okay. Hang on a second. Point nine three three. Let's see. Okay, let me look this up. 
1.5. Uh, if I look at this, it's it's 0.933. Okay, 0.9332. That area is the area to the left of 1.5. Okay, so so you subtracted it from one to get the difference, right? So you're actually what happened is you're a step ahead of us. Okay, so this area, this area from here to here was I lost track of it there. Let me get, let's get it back. This area here was 0 0.33, 0 0.3446, 0 0.3346 is this area here. Now, the area from 1.5 down is 0.9, let's see, let me get that back, 0 0.933, 0 0.933 is that area from there down, and you actually got ahead of us there. Because you calculated the area that's over here that's greater than that, right? Which is this area in here. Okay, so in other words, that area in there is equal to, it's going to be equal to 1 minus this, right? Which is going to be 0 0.067, 0 0.067, 0 0.067. I believe you did a little bit more accurately. Okay, so now. So this area is going. This area is going to be 0 0.067. Actually, you got a little bit ahead of us there because the problem asked us. The problem actually asked us for the area that's between point negative 0 0.4 and and 1.5. So it's actually looking for the area that's in here. I'm going to draw it with cross hatching this way. It's actually looking for this area in here. So we know from this point down it's point three 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 four six. And from this point down it's point nine three three. I'm gonna use your number and I'm not gonna look it up. There might be a fourth digit there but I'm not gonna worry about that. Okay it's point nine three three. So the area that we're looking for is this area which is everything subtracting this part leaves the area that we're looking for. So I could find that area by saying 0 0.9330 minus 0 0.3346. Okay? And that's going to leave us with the area that's in between these two. The area that is greater than a z-score of negative 4, but less than a z-score of plus 1.5. In other words, negative 4 is uh, 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 is uh, less than our z score, which our z score is less than 1.5. Okay, I think that's what the problem asked us for. Do you guys feel comfortable with calculating that? Did you see where I got that from? Where I got that area from? I need a little bit of feedback there from you guys over there. Okay. Are you comfortable with how I figured out what the area between those two things were? Okay, good. All right, let's look at the last part of this. Uh, let's see. What's the the last part of this was the d score that has a a, z, a positive z value of greater than two. Oh, that's kind of interesting. So, so the z score, the positive value of the z score is greater than two. So that could be a z-score of 2, or it could be a z-score of negative 2, right? A, po a, a z-score with a, a positive value of a negative 2 z-score is plus 2. So what does that mean? It's kind of like a funny definition that they have us there. That means that we're looking at, we're looking at a z-score that's above 2, right? The area for the z-score above 2 or the area for the z-score that's less than negative 2, right? Because that, if we make that a positive 2, then that's the, area, that's, the, uh, uh, that's the area for a positive 2. So it's really, since this is symmetrical, it's 2 times the area that's 2 times the area for the z-score that's greater than 2. Okay, so I'm just going to take a quick look at that. 
uh, uh, because I, I don't think you get any run tests. It's kind of a bizarre problem. You know, it's, it's kind of like a little funny ep, uh, exercise in semantics. But the z-score for 2 is 0. 0.9772. So in order to find the area that's greater than that, I would have to subtract that from 1. We want to know something. Instead of doing that, let me look up the area for negative 2. The area for negative 2 to the left is going to be the same thing as the area to the right of positive 2. So I can save myself a calculation by looking up the area for negative 2, and it's 2.28%. In other words, 0 0.228. And if I want to double that, if I want 2 times that, in other words, the area to the left of negative to the left of positive 2 z-score and the area to the left, uh, left of negative 2 z-score, but made positive. If I double that, it's going to be 2 times 2.28. Don't worry about that particular problem. Uh, it's not something that we're likely to run across uh, again. It's certainly not an exam or anything like that. But it's a little bit of a challenge, right? That's one of the reasons why textbook is nice, because it throws in a few little challenges every once in a while. Okay, let's look at the next problem. Sophia, who took the graduate record exam, scored 160 on the verbal reasoning section and 157 on the quantitative reasoning section. The mean score for the verbal reason or ver for all test takers was 151 with a standard deviation of 7. And the mean score for the quantitative reasoning session was 153 with a standard deviation of 7.67. Suppose that both distributions are normally distributed. They both are normal. In other words, the, the uh, distribution of all the scores was normally distributed around the mean, in this case, for the verbal se section, 157, and for the uh, 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 verbal reason, let's see, uh, I'm sorry, for the mean for all test takers, 151 was the mean for the verbal reasoning, and for the quantitative, it was 153. It's normally distributed with slightly different standard deviations. Write down the shorthand for these two normal distributions. Well, I'm going to skip on that because we're not going to probably be concerned about that. What What is the z-score? What is Sophia's z-score on the verbal reasoning section, on the quantitative reasoning section? And draw a standard normal curve and mark these two z-scores. Well, actually, we're going to have to draw two standard normal curves, right? One for the verbal and one for the uh, uh, quantitative reasoning. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and do that. Okay. So I, my first standard normal distribution for the verbal reasoning is going to have a mean of, is it 157? Am I right there? And for the quantitative, it's going to have a mean of 151, I think it was. Let's, go, let's take a peek back there and read that again. For all test takers, it was 151 uh, and 153. Not even close. 153 and 151. And the standard deviation for the verbal, standard deviation for the verbal was 7, I believe. Oops. Standard deviation for the verbal section was 7, and for the quantitative was 7.67. Seven, and the standard deviation for the quantitative was 7.67. Okay, so let's take a look at Sophia's scores now. Sophia's scores were, on the verbal, she scored 160. And on the, on the quantitative, she scored... I can't see where I am because I'm blocked by something. 157, 160, 157. OK, 
Okay, so on the quantitative, she scored one, on, on the verbal, she scored 160. So 160 would be somewhere around here. And 157 for the quantitative would be somewhere around here. We'll determine that in a second. Okay, so in order to figure this out, we're going to have to calculate the z-score for each of her attempts on the verbal and on the quantitative. Okay, so let's take a look at the verbal first. How many standard deviations above the mean is she for the verbal score? How many standard deviations below or below the mean is she for the quantitative score? And that's what our z-score represents. Our z-score is the difference in terms of the number of standard deviations. How do we figure that out? Well, we take the value that her score, we'll call that x, minus the mean for all students over the standard deviation. In this case, it's going to be 151 minus, excuse me, uh, her score was, her score was, what's her score again, 160? Her score was 160 and 153. 160 and 157. You know, I, I have too many windows open here. Yeah, I have windows that you can't see, and they're getting in my way here. Okay, so her score was 160 and 157, and the means were 151 and 153, 160 and 157. 160 and 157. That's 160, and this is 157. Okay, so let's take a look at our z-score. It's going to be 151 minus 160. Oh, excuse me, 160 minus 151. Our, value, our score is 160. It's higher than the mean. So that's going to make this a positive number over the standard deviation, which is 7. So 160 minus 151 is 9 over 7. So we'll figure that out in a second. Get my calculator out. What about the quantitative? What's our z-score for the quantitative? Again, Z is equal to her score, X, minus the mean over the standard deviation for the quantitative test scores, okay, which is going to be equal to 157 minus 153. Again, it's positive because it's the right side of the mean over 7.67. So that's going to be equal to 4 divided by 7.67. So... Let's get these two Z scores down. So I'll get my calculator out. So 9 divided by 7 is equal to 1.2, I'm going to call it 1.29. 1.29. And what about the, uh, 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 the Z score? for her score on the quantitative test. That's going to be 4 divided by 7.67. That's going to be equal to 0 0.52, 0 0.52, 0 0.52. Okay, I'm using basically two or three significant digits here. One of the reasons I'm doing that is because if I'm using the table for the z-score, I'm only going to be able to get it to three digits, 0 0.52 or 1.29. So I won't be able to go any further than that on the table anyway. Okay, if, in case that comes up, be the next question. So her z-score her z for her score of 160 is 1 1.2, positive 1.29. And her z-score for the uh, uh, quantitative is plus 0.52. Let's see what they ask us for next. Okay, what they ask us for next is, what do the z-scores tell us? So you tell me, what do the z-scores tell you about her score? Anyone hazard a guess is what the z-scores tell you about her score? What does the fact that they're positive tell you? Well, it tells you she did better than the average. She did better than the average. I mean, she's among the higher 50% of students uh, that took both of these exams, right? So she's above average in these exams. Okay, so that's, that's a good start, right? Actually, we can quantify that a bit more. Perhaps they're going to have us 
do that in the next part. Find her percentile scores for the two exams. Well, what is a percentile score? The percentile score is the percentage of students that scored below you on an exam. So, for instance, if you're in the 90th percentile, that means that you, if you're, excuse me, you can look at it two ways. That's the percentage of students that did either better or worse than you. So, from our perspective, looking at this chart, if you're in the top 10% or the 10th percentile, you would say 90% of the students did worse than you, right? So let's take a look at what our percentiles would be. So in order to see what our percentile is, that we would have to know what percentage of students did worse than she did, were below her in each one of these two exams, okay? So what percentage is that? Well, we can figure that out by using the z-table, right? We know that the z-score for her value, for her score, is 1.29. So we can find the percentage of students that took the exam that uh, scored lower than she did. Let's give that a try, 1.29. Okay, so z-score of 1.29. One point two zero, one two three four five six seven eight nine. Looks like point nine point nine zero one five. Hmm. Hmm. So that looks very much like I was just describing it. Point nine zero one. I think two five went one five. Point nine zero one five. I think it was. Right. Well, what does that tell you? That tells you that only ten percent a one minus this, of the students scored better than her. So she is in the 10th percentile. Okay, now I'm going to ask you to tell me what percentile was she in in the quantitative exam. Okay, remember her z-score is 0.52. So you look up what percent, you figure out what percentile that she was in. I'm going to give you a minute to do that. I'll pause recording. I'll resume recording again. Okay, and let's take a look at this. Okay, so what is the area to the left of a z-score of 0.52? Let's look that up. Area to the left of a z-score of 0.52, it's a positive number, so it's going to be greater than 50%. 0 0.5012 is 0.6985. So this area to the left is 0.6985. Eight, five, right? Approximately 70%. So approximately 70% of the students scored lower than she did, actually 69.85%. So that means she's in the top 30%. Her percentile is 30%, or actually more precisely 30, 30.30.3015 uh, is her percentile, right? About 30, 30%, 30th percentile. She's in the top 30% of takers of this exam. On the verbal part, she was in the top 10%. We could find that out by looking at the z-score. Okay, let's take a look at the next part. Uh, what percentage of test takers did better than her on the two, sec the two sections? Okay, what, explain why simple, simply comparing her raw scores from the two sections would lead to incorrect conclusion that she did better on the uh, quantitative set, uh, set. well, the raw z, the raw scores will not tell you, will not tell you, uh, 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 will not make up for the normal characteristics of the normal distribution. In other words, as she gets closer to the highest scores, there are fewer and fewer people in front of her. As she gets closest to the lowest scores, there are fewer and fewer people that are in front of her. So. So if you are, if you are, if, if you have this, uh, if the, if the mean score is 50%, the highest score is 100, lowest score is zero, to say that, and it's normally distributed, to say if you got a score of 75%, that you're in the top 25%, that wouldn't make any sense, would it? Because really your percentile is higher because there's fewer people at either extreme. Okay, so we can't just look at the numbers, we have to use the, the normal distribution, the, the uh, uh, percentages that are represented by the normal distribution and the z-score 
to let us know what the true percentage of people that are did a high at, that were likely to have had a higher score or a lower score than she did. If the distribution of scores on these exams are not not nearly normal, what would your answers would your answers to parts B through F change? Well, yeah, we would have a problem with that, wouldn't we? They're not normally distributed, then we can't rely on the Z table to uh, 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 give us the uh, uh, predict reliably what the percentages are based on the Z scores. Okay, so we wouldn't rely on this. This whole thing is based on the fact that this distribution is at least approximately normal. When we get into the central limit theorem, okay, which involves samples from a population like this, this is the actual population, of course, because this is everybody that took the test. That's what we're looking at in this distribution. When we get into the central limit theorem, we're looking at samples from a distribution. Even if the population that we took it from is not perfectly normal, if the samples are large enough, then you can expect the rules in the central limit theorem to work for you uh, because the distribution of the sample means will likely be normally distributed. We'll get to that as we move on. But uh, keep that in mind that uh, when we're dealing with central limit theorem, we have a lot more latitude with this. Okay, let's take a look at this. The weather's been hot the last few days, so this is appropriate. Okay, unfortunately, it's uh, California weather, but, you know, what can we do? The average daily high temperature in June in L.A. is 77 degrees Fahrenheit with a standard deviation of 5 degrees. Suppose that the temperature in June closely follows a normal distribution. What's the probability of observing? First of all, number one, that doesn't seem like it does. Because it's probably a different temperature at the beginning of June than it is the end of June. Uh, it's probably not really random and so on and so forth. But we're going to assume, they're asking us to assume it's normally distributed for the purposes of this problem. What is the probability of observing an 83 degree temperature or higher in L.A. during a randomly chosen day in June? Okay, well, it's just, that's really simple. That's really basically just what we've been doing so far. Okay, let's close this. Open up a, a sheet of paper. And draw a normal distribution. Here's our normal distribution of temperatures in L.A. in June. And the mean temperature is, I think, 73, was it? Okay, mean temperature was 77, 5 degree uh, delta T, 5 degree standard deviation. 77, 5 degrees. Mean is 77 degrees, and standard deviation is equal to 5 degrees. And we're interested in what's the likelihood of having a, a day that's over 83 degrees. 83 degrees or higher. 83. To make that a little clearer, that 3. 83 degrees or higher. Well, we know because this is a normal distribution, the further we get from the mean, the less likely that that is to occur. So in order to calculate how likely that would be to occur in a normal distribution, we would find the z-score for the value 83. So that's going to be equal to x minus mu over the standard deviation. Of course, mu is the mean temperature for the month of June. So that's going to be uh, uh, 77. Uh, excuse me, it's going to be x is going to be 83. That's our value we're interested in. Minus mu, which is 77, over standard deviation is 5. That's going to be equal to 6 over 5, or 1.2, a positive 1.2, 83 minus 77, positive numbers, positive 1.2. So now, what's the probability? What is the probability? Probability that we're over 83, or we're a day over 3, is the area above 83. So let's calculate what that area is above the value, z value 1.2. Okay, so let's take a look at this. The z value 1.2 would represent an area to the left, not to the right, but to the left. 1.20 would be 88.49, or about 88 and a half. So this would be, from this area down, would be 0.88549, I think it was, 88 and a half, right? So that would leave uh, point one one. 
five, about 11.5% to the left of that, to the right of that, right? So the probability, the probability of getting a temperature that's greater, greater than 83 degrees, right, is going to be equal to 0.115. Let me show you a quick little trick here. The area to the left of of this z score is 88.49, leaving us roughly with 0.115. Okay, well, I had to do a subtraction, I had to subtract this from one in order to get that 0.115. But you know, an area to, the, to this area, 1.2 to the right of 1.2, is the same area as the area to the left of negative 1.2. Why is that? That's because the standard normal distribution is symmetrical. So this area to the left of negative 1.2 is the same as the area to the right of positive 1.2. Let me, I could have, instead of doing that, I could have saved myself a step and looked up the area for uh, uh, negative 0.12. Negative 0.12, and there it is, 0.115. Okay, I could have saved myself a step there, right? So keep in mind, there's a lot of shortcuts to this. And also keep in mind, that it really pays to actually, you know, probably after a few more problems, you'll be able to do this in your head, but it really pays to sketch this out because it'll help you avoid uh, kind of silly errors. Because if you look at it on here and kind of get a, a view for which area that you're looking at, like in other words, if we were looking for this area in here and we decided that it was 88.5%, 88 .5%, this area in here, we say to ourselves, well, that can't be. You know, it's it's less than half of this whole thing. It's a small portion of this whole thing. So 88.4, what did I forget to do? Oh, I forgot to subtract from one. So it'll help you avoid some silly errors. Okay, so let's move on to another problem. Oh, wait, now before we do, how are how cold are the coldest 10% of the days during June in LA? How cold are the coldest 10% of the days? In other words, what is the temperature that represents the coldest 10% of the days? In other words, this area is 10% of the total days in June. That's how cold the coldest 10% of the days. So what we're interested in there is finding out what the X value is, what that temperature is that represents the coldest 10% of the days. Well, in that case, we use our table backwards. We know, we know that we want the area to be the smallest 10% of this distribution, and we want to find out what the z-score is for that value, for, uh, that temperature, right? So let's use our, our table that way. So let's look in the, inside the part that gives us the areas, not the z-score, and look for 10%. So 10% is going to be 0 0.01, let's see, 0 0.01. It looks like that might be... Our best, let's see, here we go. The closest one is negative, oh, sorry, that's 1%. Point. Is that 1%? Yes, yeah, no. Point 0.1, point 0.0, point 0.0. No, that's 1%. That's 0 0.01, that's 1%. We want 10%. Point 0.10. Point 0.10. 10%. Let's see how close to 10% I can get. Well, this one looks like it's the closest right here, right? 0.10 is 10%. 10, 10 cents out of a dollar or 1% or 10%. Okay, that's negative 1.2. I think that's 8. Negative 1.28. So the Z score that represents that area to the left being 10% is one, negative 1.28. Okay. So now, that's great. That's what the z-score is. But what I want to know is the temperature. I want to know what x is. Well, you know, I can use my formula for the z-score backwards. Okay, how am I going to do that? Well, let's see. z is equal to x, the temperature I'm interested in, minus the mean over sigma. So what is this? Let's see what this is. Well, z is equal to negative 1.28. And I want to know what the x is. Well, x, we don't know. That's what we want to calculate it. Minus the mean, which is 77, over the standard deviation, which is 5, 
the only unknown here now is the temperature x, right? So I can figure out what temperature corresponds to a z-score of negative 1.28. Okay, let's give that a try. First, I'm going to multiply both sides of this equation by 5, right? So I'm going to cross multiply, right? This times this is equal to this times this. So x minus 77 is equal to uh, 5 times negative 1.28. So let's see, that's going to be uh, 5 is 0, 4 carry to 4, 14 carry to 1. Uh, where am I here? Carry to 4, 10. Wait, uh, 15 carry to 1. No, no, no. Uh, all right, well, let me do it this way. 1.25 times 5 is going to be 6. 4 times that is 6. And 05, I'm going to use my calculator. I'm going to screw this up. 1.28. Times five is equal to six point four. Six whoops, six point four. Notice it's a negative number though. Negative six point four. Negative six point four, right, is equal to x minus seventy-seven. And I'm gonna move the negative seventy-seven over the other side, it becomes plus seventy-seven, plus seventy-seven minus six point four. So the temperature, the, the, the lowest, the lowest, lower 10% of the days, the temperature is going to be uh, 70.6, right? Okay, 10% of the days are going to be below 70.6. The other 90% of the days are going to be above 70.6. Okay, so do I still have you guys? You still guys, are, are you in on that? Are you okay with that? Okay, good. So you can use that table backwards and take advantage of this formula, which in the case where you know the z-score and you don't know what x is, you can use it backwards. You only, yeah, since you're only going to wind up with one unknown, you could use that to solve that problem. Okay. So I'm going to move on to another problem. Okay, here's another one involving standard deviation. So I'm going to, this is the last one I'm going to do that involves a uh, normal distribution and standard deviation. I'm going to start to move on to binomial distribution and on to central limit theorem after this. Suppose the weights of checked baggage of airline passengers follow normal, nearly normal distribution with a mean weight of 45 pounds. You know that everybody I know that's checking their luggage has about 45 pounds because 50 pounds to pay extra. Uh, mean weight of 45 pounds and a standard deviation of 3.2 pounds. Most airlines charge a flat fee for baggage that, uh, 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 charge a fee for ba an extra fee. They, they all charge. This is an old, this is, this, this is an old uh, version of this problem. Now they always charge a fee for baggage, and they charge a lot of money if you go over 50 pounds. Um, uh, fee for baggage that weigh in over in next to pounds. What percentage of airline passengers wind up going over 50 pounds? The mean is 45. The standard deviation is 3.2. What percentage go over 50 pounds? So our X is 50 pounds. We want to know what percentage are above that X of 50 pounds. Let's draw a distribution. Okay, our mean is 45 pounds. Our standard deviation was three something pounds. Standard deviation, 3.2 pounds. Oops. 3 point, oops, 3.2 pounds. And we want to know what percentage of these bags go above 50 pounds, right? Percentage are above 50 pounds. Well, this is actually a pretty easy one, isn't it? Because now we have to figure out what that z-score is and find the area that's above here. 
So Z is equal to the value, uh, th that value that we want to find the area for X, which is 50, we know already, minus mu over the standard deviation, which is 3.2. So this is going to be equal, Z is going to be equal to 50 minus 45 over 3.2 is equal to 5 over 3.2. We see it's going to be a positive number. So the area to the left of that's going to be more than 50%. That's going to be equal to, and let's do that calculation here, 5 divided by 3.2 is 1.56. One point five six. So our z score is equal to one point five six. This z score for this normal distribution represents fifty pounds. Then we want to know the area to the right of that. Okay, can somebody suggest to me what a shortcut for this might be? Well, it might be a good shortcut for this because what I'm about to do is find the area using my table, find the area for a z-score of plus 1.56, which represents the area from here to the right, right? And then subtract it from 1. Anybody want to suggest a uh, quicker way of doing it? How about if I find the area for a z-score of negative 1.56, which would be this area here, which is going to be symmetrical to that area on that. It doesn't look like it the way I drew it, but it was going to be symmetrical with the same size as this area here and save me a uh, little bit of trouble. Right, that, thank you, Elisa. Perfect. So let's do that instead. Let's skip that extra step. Negative 1.56, 1, negative 1. 0.5023456. That's about, I'm going to round that off to 6%, 0 0.0594. So this is going to be, this is going to be, 6%, which means that this area has to be 6% also. So 6% of the bags get charged extra money, and the airlines make a few extra bucks, a couple of extra book, book. Actually, nobody nobody takes books anymore, right? They bring their Kindle or something like that. But I remember years ago, uh, we, always, we were always juggling books between bags to get them under 50 pounds, but now we use Kindles. So we don't have to use that. We don't have to worry about that anymore. iPads and Kindles. And so, at any rate, so that's how we, we would figure that out. We saved ourselves a little bit of trouble by doing it that way. This yellow one's a little bit more advanced. I'm not going to bother playing around with it for right now. Okay, so we're at about 6.45. I'm going to suggest we take a 10-minute break, relax a bit, and come back to this at 6.55. And uh, we'll go on with some, some more material. I'm going to actually uh, 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 talk about the normal approximation and move on from there. Okay, guys, so let's take a 10-minute break from this. Okay, I got a little warning on the network speed there, but I think we're okay now. Okay, so I want to take a look at what a normal distribution looks like. And... Uh, just uh, just to give us an illustration of that, I, I grabbed a couple of files that um, uh, are used here in some of these problems. Uh, I have them set up as a couple of Excel files right now. For instance, th there's a uh, distribution of student scores, I think it is. Looks something like this. If it come up, there we go. I'm going to increase the size of this. And I can find the mean, I can use a, uh, Excel to find mean, standard deviation, so on and so forth, of all these various scores that are approximately normally distributed. And I have another one, another version of this, which may not be quite as normally distributed as the first. I want to take a look at both of these uh, in, in SPSS. I'm going to open them in SPSS. So I'm going to go down here, start up SPSS. And SPSS will allow me to import Excel files and work with them uh, in SPSS. So I'm going to demonstrate that. I'm going to open S start SPSS. And hopefully it'll start up quickly. Well, 
Taking a while. Um, well, I'll tell you, it depends on how many people show up. I want to be able to have as much face time with people as possible since it happens so rarely this semester, you know, because of this whole, you know, like hybrid online uh, method that we're using. So, so um, uh, I anticipate that by sure, by sh certainly by eight o'clock, it will be posted for sure. And if we break up earlier than that, then as soon as we break up, I will post it. Okay, so if you're in there, you'll know. You'll actually know if you stop by. You'll actually know. If not, just keep an eye on Blackboard, and uh, I'll send out an announcement as soon as it's posted. Okay, so I am going to up oh, my license is going to expire soon. Okay, so I'm going to SVSS. I'm going to say open data, find my Excel file, which is on my desktop in session five. I have to search for Excel files so I can find them. And let's open this one first. Okay, and it's telling me it finds data from A1 to A25. That looks good. So I'm going to ask it to open it for me. And indeed, there is all my data. So I'm going to take a look at this to see if I can determine if this is normally distributed. So I'm going to say, let's see. I'm going to say uh, analyze, descriptive statistics, explore. I want to compare the mean and the median, for instance, explore, and I'm going to ask it to find a whole bunch of statistics for me. Okay, I'll leave this just checked off for all the descriptive statistics and say, okay, an output window is about to open up and let's see what this looks like. Oh, there I get my box plot. You know, it would have been nice to have a histogram, wouldn't it? Analyze, I'm going to go back in again to explore, except this time under plots, I'm going to ask it to include a histogram. And I'll click continue. And OK, that's simple. OK, just have to open it and select that file. So I'm looking at this. And gee, it looks like it's fairly normally distributed. Looks like it might be skewed a little bit towards the high end. In other words, there might be a right skew. This, this person that has an exceptionally high score for these students, this person might be pulling the average up, but not affecting the median that much. So it looks to me like maybe the median is going to be higher than the average here. Looks though, though it looks fairly normally distributed. So let's look at our, our uh, box plot. Our box plot illustrates that very dramatically, doesn't it? You can see that uh, 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 the higher values, that, that there are more higher values, positive values, that go further out than the lower values. And the median is in the middle of the, the interquartile range. That's the median. So it looks like this is right skewed or positively skewed. There are some values here that are pulling the average up. Let's take a look at compare the average and the median. The mean, the average is 61.52, and the median is 61. Yeah, indeed, the, the mean is a bit higher than the median, where normally a perfectly normally distributed uh, uh, distribution, they would be the same. Okay, let's do that again. Except let's do this for, let's do it for this other uh, file. Let's say open data. And I'm going to look at the data file that's in problem 18. Uh, let's see Excel files. Problem 18, let's open that one. And let's look at that distribution. Analyze, script and statistics, explore, because I want those extra uh, statistics. Moving into the dependence list, click plots. Tell them I want a histogram as well. Continue and have it tell me the various statistics. Okay, let's see what our histogram looks like here. There's our first one. Whoops. Oh, it looks very similar, doesn't it? In fact, it looks a little too similar. I wonder if I got the same data twice. I might have. 61, median, 5.52. Yeah, it sure looks like it, right? Did I open the same one up twice? Uh, 25 cases. This one has, yeah, I think I got the same one twice. Let's try this again. Open, data. 
and Excel. Let me go to the uh, before I do that. Let me take a look at them in, in Excel. Mm -hmm. Oh, you want to know? I think I got the same data. I got have the same data file twice because they're exactly the same size. Let's see what this one looks like. Let's see what this one looks like. Yeah, it is unfortunately the same data file. Not bummer. Oh, okay. Unfortunately, I wound up with the wrong data files there. So we're going to have to check. We'll have to check. We'll have to pass on that part. Okay, but you saw it from the first one. We were able to identify that as being slightly skewed positively or to the right, but otherwise being a relatively normal distribution. So I'll move on from there. So we got that part in anyway. So keep that in mind. That's that, that when you determine the skew of the distribution, if we give you a, a histogram, and we ask you to determine whether it's positively or negatively skewed, you'd be looking to see if there's any extreme values that pull the average away from the middle value, away from the mean. So if there's a very low value or a few very low values that don't seem connected to the histogram, that are further out than the end of the histogram, those would be negatively or, uh, or uh, left skewed. If you see higher values, a couple of higher values that are pulling the average up, away from the median, okay, those would be right or positively skewed. So I'm going to quit SPSS. And I'm going to go back here. Okay, let's go back to our, our uh, uh, problem set. Okay, so I'm going to move on now to uh, uh, the uh, binomial distribution and some probability issues. Okay, so a machine, you know, I'm going to come back to this one. This one's a little bit more complicated than some of the others, I think. Okay, let's start with this one. Suppose we take a, uh, uh, the uh, National Vaccine Information Center estimates that 90% of Americans have had chickenpox by the time they re reach adulthood. I wonder if that's true anymore. They have a vaccine for chickenpox now, right? So, so back in those, back when I was a kid, everybody got chickenpox. Everybody had chickenpox, everybody got monks. Everybody got a couple of other childhood diseases. But nowadays, uh, I wonder about that with vaccines that we have now. Suppose that we take a random sample. Um, um, uh, uh, instead of saying that they've had chickenpox, they have either had it or had a vaccine for chickenpox. Okay, so let's say, suppose we have a random sample of 100 American adults. In, let the use of binomial distribution be appropriate for calculating the probability that exactly six can, excuse me, uh, calculating the probability exactly six consumed alcohol beverages. Well, no, because that's got nothing to do with this problem. Correct? Okay, so we're not gonna we're not gonna look at that one. I, I don't know what happened there. Let's take a look at the next one. Calculate the probability that ninety-seven. <laughs> yeah, right. Great. Calculate the probability that 97 out of 100 randomly sampled American adults had chicken pox during childhood. Exactly 97 out of 100. Well, how do we do that? It's a binomial distribution, right? You've either had chicken pox or you haven't had chicken pox. We randomly sample 100 American adults and we ask them, have you had chicken pox? What's the likelihood that exactly 97 out of those 100 are going to tell us yes? So what do we know there? We know what our what our success is going to be. It's going to be yes. They say yes. They had chicken pox. We know what our trial size is going to be. It's a hundred. Hundred people we're going to sample, and we know the probability that any individual in this population has chicken pox, has had chicken pox or a vaccine, is ninety percent. So we know the three things that we need for the binomial distribution in Excel. So I'm going to go ahead and open Excel. Blow this up a little bit so we can see it. So in order to use the binomial distribution, I'm going to say equals binom, binom dist 
parentheses, and it's going to allow me now to fill in these various values. Number of successes, in other words, number of successes is 97 out of 100 individuals with a probability for each individual of 0.9 or 90%. And now I have to decide on whether to put in true or false for cumulative. Well, it's asking me for the probability that we would get exactly 97 out of 100, not 97 or fewer, not 97 or more, not more than 97, but exactly 97. So cumulative is going to be false, right? I'm going to say I only want that, that probability, and I'm going to hit enter. And the probability is very low because out of all those possibilities we might get, to get exactly 97 out of 100 is not all that likely. In fact, it's only about half, a, half, half of a percent or 0.6% is going to be the probability. Let's look at the next part of this. If they have six children, what is the... Okay, oops, I skipped I skipped up here somehow or other. I got carried away here. Let me find a problem again. Here we go, chicken box. I thought we were going to wind up with another alcoholic beverage thing there. What is the probability that at least one out of ten randomly selected American adults have had chicken pox? At least one out of ten. So let me think about what does that mean, at least one out of ten? That would mean one, two, three, four, five, to ten out of uh, 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 at least one out of every ten randomly sampled adults have had chicken pox. At least one out of ten. So what would that not include? Well, that would not include zero. So there's two ways for me to figure this out. One way is to take uh, say cumulative false and say equals binome this and figure out what the probability is for exactly 1, comma, 10, trial size of 10, probability 0.9, comma, false. That's exactly the probability for 1 out of 10. And then I could do that for 2 out of 10, 3 out of 10, 4 out of 10, and so on and so forth, and add all of those together. The other way I could do this is I could say to myself, what's the probability? What is the only thing that's not represented here is 0. 0 is the only possibility that is not included here, right? So I could just figure out the probability for zero and subtract it from one. So actually the probability of zero is gonna be very small. Okay, zero comma, oops. At least one out of, uh, uh, out of 10 randomly said, bad chicken box, zero comma, uh, 10 comma, Oops, 10, comma, uh, 0.9, comma. And I could say true or false here because if I say true, if I say false, it's only giving me a probability for zero. If I say true, it's going to give me the same thing because there's nothing below zero anyway. So that's actually, that's actually going to be, uh, let me see here. I think I messed that up here. I put zero in there instead of 0.9. Okay, that's one to the minus 10th. It's a tiny number, right? And one minus that number is going to be basically pretty much one. Right? One minus equals one minus 10 to the minus 10th is going to be basically one. I'm not going to bother doing it. It's really 0.99999. It's going to be a very uh, high probability, a very low probability uh, that you get zero out of 10, and a very high probability that you get at least one, two, three, four, five, or more uh, out of 10. What's the probability that at most three out of 10 randomly sampled American adults would have, would have not had chicken pox? Okay, so the probability that you have chicken pox is equal to 0.9. What's the probability you don't have it? Didn't have it. That's going to be equal to 0.1, right? The probability you've had it is 90%, and the probability you haven't is 10%. So now the problem they're asking is, is let's see, is equal to, let's see, binome this. And we're looking for the probability that at most three. So in other words, three, two, one or zero. At most three would include those four numbers. 
So I can put in three and call this cumulative, give me the, the probability of having three or fewer that have not had uh, uh, chicken pox uh, or a chicken pox vaccine. Three comma, trial size of 10, comma, 0.1, because not is our uh, criteria now, and true for cumulative. Okay, so that's going to give me the probability for having three people or fewer out of 10 that have not had chicken pox. Probability for any individual is 10% because it's the, uh, we subtracted 90% from 100%. Okay, what is it? It's 98, it's almost 99% likely that you would have three or fewer people that will not have had uh, chicken pox uh, 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 out, of ten, out of 10 people that you select. So three, two, one, or zero. Uh, okay, of course, the most likely scenario is nine out of 10 would have had chicken pox or one out of 10 would not have had chicken pox. Right, so either one of those two is the most likely scenario, depending on if you're looking at the probability of having it or the probability of not having it. Okay, so let's move on from that one. Suppose a university in, uh, announced that it admitted 2,500 students for the following year's freshman class. However, the university has dorm room spots for only 1,786 freshman students. If there's a 70% chance that an admitted student will decide to accept the offer and attend the university, what's the probability that the university will not have enough dormitory spots for the freshman class? Okay, so what, let's see how we can figure this out using the binomial distribution. So we want to know what's the probability that we would get more than 1,786 freshmen saying yes and not no out of 25 25. 100 students, giving that chances of 70% that they're going to say yes. Okay, well, that's a, that sounds like a binomial distribution. Equals binome dist, parentheses. And now we want to know the probability of more than 1,786 students. Well, binome dist works the other way, that down. So let's, let's say, what's the probability of getting fewer than 1,786? 1,786 or fewer. Okay, so our six, number of success is 1,786, comma, okay, and our trials is going to be 2,500 students, comma, and the probability that anyone, any student will go, will, will go to school there is 70%, comma, and if we say true, we will get the probability that we would have 1,786 or fewer students or fewer students that say yes to going to the school. So let's see what that probability is. That probability is 94.5%, right? So what's the probability that we would get more than 786 students saying yes? Well, that's going to be equal to 1 minus 94.5%, or about 5.5%. So there's only about a 5.5% chance that they're going to run out of dorm space for that semester. It's not 0% chance, only a 5.5% chance. Okay, so that's how one kind of application of the binomial distribution. Okay, here's another application of the binomial distribution. Okay, and this one, I'm going to give you a chance to uh, uh, chime in and give this a try. Um, 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 uh, we have a husband and a wife with bright, brown eyes who have a 75% probability of having children with brown eyes, a 12.5% probability of having children with blue eyes, and a 12.5% probability of having children with green eyes. If you add them up all together, that's all the probabilities that we uh, can have. What is the probability that their first child will have green eyes and the second one will not? Hmm, very interesting, okay? So what's the probability that the first child would have green eyes? Anybody want to hazard a guess? What's the probability that any one of their children would have green eyes? Right? Probability of any of the children having green eyes is 0.125. Right? Oh, okay. So that's simple enough, right? Probability the first child would have green eyes is 0.125. But now there's, we added something else onto that. If that happens now, 
where we're concerned, what about the probability that the second will not? Well, the probability that the second one will not, it, it means that they could have brown eyes, they could have blue eyes. So the probability they won't have brown eyes is 0.75 plus 1.25 is about 87.5%. So the probability of the first event occurring, right? And it's independent. The two children don't know each other, right? It's, it's, a, it's a random a mixing of genes. So the two children don't know each other. are not going to affect this, right? So the probability that the first child will have green eyes is 0.125. And the probability that the second child will not is 0.85. So the probability that it'll occur in exactly this sequence, green eyes, first child, and not green eyes, second child, is going to be 0.125 times 0.875. Okay, probability the first one, just, just the way we would flip a coin, except in this case, uh, um, uh, it's flipping a, a coin once and then flipping, say, a penny once and flipping a quarter second, 50-50 on those, but... Uh, uh, how, what, we could look at it say it's the probability of flipping a heads on the uh, flipping a heads and then following that by rolling a five on a die, right? One is one point one to two, the other one is one to six, and to find the probability of both of them occurring, just multiply the first one times the second one. Okay, so that's a little bit of a curve, right? That they threw that in there first. Now I think they're going to move back to the binomial distribution. What's the probability that exactly one of their two children will have green eyes? What's the probability exactly one of the two will have green eyes? Well, now let's apply the binomial distribution. Equals binome dist, parentheses. So number of successes, one of their two, at least that exactly one of their two children. So one, zero doesn't count. It's exactly one, right? One doesn't count. Two doesn't count. Uh, their sample size is two. They're going to have two children. And the probability of having green eyes is 0.125. And cumulative is going to be false because we only want that specific outcome. And the probability is about 22% that exactly one of their two children, if they have two children, is going to have green eyes. Okay, so, so let's move on to the next part. If they have six children, well, they're really building up a big family here. If they have six children, what's the probability that exactly two will have green eyes? Well, what's changed here? <clears throat> Our sample size has changed. And the criteria that we're using, no, we, uh, the criteria we're using is exactly two this time. We'll have green eyes. So let's do this again. Equals binome dist. Again, it's going to be true. It's going to be false for cumulative because we want this exact outcome. Okay. So what is, well, how many successes are we predicting? Two green eyes out of six children, six trials, comma, 0.125, comma, false. Right? Just for that exact outcome, two out of six children. Probability that happened is about 14%, 13.7, or about 14%. Okay, so let's take a look at the next problem. If they have six children, what is the probability that at least one will have green eyes? So I'm going to wait for you guys. To do that one. You guys go ahead and give that one a try. They're going to have six children. Trial size is going to be six children, right? Probability at least one will have green eyes. So you can't calculate up. You can only calculate down. So what's the only pro what's the only outcome that isn't counted here? One, two, three, four, five, six. How many children having green eyes is not included here? But zero, right? So our successes are going to be zero, right? Exactly. Zero is not counted. So what's the probability that we're going to get this? Do you guys have uh, Excel running now? Or are you running Excel the same way? 0.55. I'm going to give that a try myself. Okay. See if the answer is right. Equals binome dist parentheses. And the probability of having, uh, let's see, zero, comma, now, this is the only outcome that's not included in what we're really looking for, comma, out of six children, comma, 0.125, comma, false or true, it doesn't matter for zero. I'll write true, just for the hell of it, is equal to 0.448. So there is a 0.4, a 0.45 chance, 45% chance of having no children that have green eyes out of six. 
So the probability of having at least one is going to be equal to one minus the probability of having none, okay, which is 0.55, which is right. You got it right, that point. Uh, and she got it right. Uh, uh, okay, you rounded it a little bit. You know, when I, when I put in the answers to the exams and the homeworks, I give an acceptable range. So chances are, unless I told you I'd be three decimal places, you would have been okay with 0.44, I think, or 0.54. 0.56, rather. Uh, uh, exactly. Zero is 0.4. Exactly right. Good work. Okay, good. I'm glad this is catching on. Um, would it be considered unusual if only two out of the six children had brown eyes? Only two out of six. Um, okay, how unusual is that? Uh, uh, how many children? Let's see. Two out of six children. Is that an unusual event? Let's, let's find that out. Equals binome dist. What's the probability exactly two children out of, let's see, six, uh, two children out of six have brown eyes. The probability of brown, having brown eyes is 0.75, comma, and I'm going to say only two. Okay, I'm going to say false for cumulative. And I'm looking at just that outcome. Okay, and that outcome is about 3% of the time. 3% of the time, uh, 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 you will have only two children that out of six that would have brown eyes. Because so you would expect to have brown eyes 75% of the time for each child. So that would come up. Let me just make sure I got that right. Two, comma, six, point seven five, and false. Yep. And the probability, what would the probability of having uh, two or fewer children out of six? Okay, then we would have changed that to true. Binome. This parentheses two comma six two successes out of six trials 0.75 probability of success in each trial and true for all for two or fewer and that would be just a little bit more why is it just a little bit more because it's really unlikely you would only have one out of six that would have brown eyes and it's very unlikely that you would have none out of six. Uh, that have brown eyes, given how likely it is to have brown eyes for these for this particular couple. Okay, so that kind of makes a bit of sense, doesn't it? Okay. So, okay, let's move on from there. Okay, let's see. Okay, I want to talk about central limit there. So we're going to go up to the next chapter. Chapter four. And look at some of the problems in there. Okay, first of all, when we talk about central limit theorem, we're talking about the perform the way that samples, random samples from a population, a normal population, distribute themselves. Okay, or from any population for that matter, distribute themselves. And one of the natures of the central limit theorem is if you take a random sample from a population, you would expect the means of those samples, if you take repeated samples of the same size and find the means, the averages for each one of those samples, when you look at the way those sample means distributed themselves, that would be normal also. In fact, it might even be normal if the sample size is big enough, it might even be normal for populations that are not perfectly normal. That by themselves. Okay, so central limit theorem uh, uh, raises our game a little bit where that's concerned. Okay, so why are we interested in this anyway? Because so frequently we're interested in where the mean is or where the average is, where the middle of a population is, is uh, located. Okay, so because we're so interested in the mean and kind of also in the, in the proportion, the middle of the, the percentage uh, for binomial, for instance, what percentage of people have diabetes? What percentage of people uh, have high blood lead level, high blood lead levels, and so on and so forth? Since we're so interested in that center thing, we have a special name for that. We call that a point estimate. That's the point that represents the middle of that population. And we can have two kinds of point estimates. We can have sample means, and we can have uh, proportions. Both of those are point estimates. Okay, but the the point estimate is not the population mean 
uh, it's the sample mean. So in other words, X bar or P cap, those represent our point estimates, our estimates of the actual mean of the population. I want to get down here to these problems so we can discuss that. Okay, here we go. Is that the first one I highlighted? No, yeah, I think not yet, yeah, not quite. Okay, here we go. Okay, identified parameter. For each of the following situations, state whether the parameter of interest is a mean or a proportion. Okay, in a survey, 100 college students are asked how many hours per week they spend on their on the internet. What kind of what kind of point estimate is that? Is that a mean or a proportion? It's a mean, right? The average number of hours. In a survey, 100 college students were asked, what percentage of the time do you spend on the internet as part of your coursework? Ooh, that's a little tricky, right? Percentage. So one student might say 10%. Another student might be 45%. Another student might be 60%. That's also a mean. You take the average of the percentages that they report. In a survey, 100 college students are asked whether or not they cited information from Wikipedia. Oh, now hang on a second. That's the first one where the answer is not a number like hours or, or dollars or hours per week or percentages. That's the first one where the answer is a yes or a no. So when we add up all the yeses and nos, we're going to wind up with a proportion. 50% said yes, 10% said yes, and so on and so forth. So that point estimate is a proportion. In a survey, 100 college students are asked what percentage of their total work of the total weekly spending is on alcoholic beverages. Again, they're asking them to report a number or percentage, but not a yes or a no. In, in a sample of 100 recent college graduates, it's found that 85% expect to get a job within one year of their graduation date. So in other words, 85% of them says, yeah, I'm going to get a job within a year. 15% uh, of them didn't say that. So that's a proportion as well. Okay, a little tricky, right? But I just wanted to go through those quickly. So what's the important part of this? The important part of this is, is that in cases like that, we're never going to know the true population proportions. The true population mean, the true population proportion or percentage. We're never going to know that. So our only window on that is the sample that we take, right? So we've got to understand the way samples behave. Okay, so let's take a look at this. The distribution of number of eggs laid by a certain species of hen during a breeding period is 35 eggs with a standard deviation of 18.2. Suppose a group of researchers randomly samples 45 hens of this species uh, uh, and counts the number of eggs laid during their breeding period and records the sample mean. They repeat this a thousand times and build a sample distribution of sample means. Okay, so what is this distribution called? This distribution is the sample distribution, right? It's the distribution of all the sample means. Okay, would you expect the shape of this distribution to be symmetric, right skewed, or left skewed? What do you guys think? What does the central limit theorem tell us about the distribution of sample means? Right skewed, left skewed, or, or uh, uh, normal, symmetric. Symmetric meaning normal. Got a guess there? We would expect it to be symmetric, right? We would expect it to be symmetric because we've taken a decent sample size, 45. So even if the original population is not, some, is not normally distributed, we would expect the results of our sample means to be normally distributed. Calculate the variability of this distribution and state the appropriate term used to refer to this value. So, so we know that the population standard deviation is 18.2. Can we figure out what the standard deviation is for the sample means? And what would that be called? What's the appropriate term that we would use for that? Standard error, great, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Okay, so let me, uh, let me open something up here. Make it right. Okay, I'm gonna actually calculate it. Fresh piece of paper. Okay. Okay. So looking back at this, the standard deviation is 
for the population. 18.2. So what is our standard error? Our standard error is going to be equal to sigma for the population or the square root of the sample size. So sigma is 18.2, right? And usually our standard error, always our standard error is going to be a smaller number than sigma because we're going to divide, divide it by the square root of the sample size. Sample size was square root of 45. So let's see what that comes down to. Pull up my calculator. Clear. 45. Take the square root of that. And it comes out to be 6.7. I'm going to put it into memory. And I'll clear it. 6.7. Okay. And I'm going to divide 18.2. Divided by 6.7 is going to be equal to 2.71. So our standard error is going to be equal to 2.71. So our sample means are going to be a much tighter distribution than our population. It's going to be much less spread out than our population. Okay, so okay, next. Suppose the researcher budget is reduced and you're only able to collect random samples of 10 hens. The sample mean of the number of hens is recorded, repeated a thousand times, and we find a new distribution of sample means. How will the variability of the new distribution compare to the variability of the original distribution? Well, since the square root of n, right, determines what we divide into sigma, if this is a smaller number, then we're going to wind up with a bigger, it's going to be a smaller number on the bottom, we're going to divide that 18.2 by as big a number. So it's going to wind up being a larger standard error, more variability in our sample means. They're going to be spread out more. So it's going to be sigma over the square root of n. It's going to be 18.2 divided by the square root of 10 is going to be equal to, let's work that out now. Okay, let me clear my memory. Clear this. And let's see, the 10, square root of 10 is equal to that, memory, and the 18.2 divided by the square root of 10 is equal to 5.75, 5.76. Right, so the variability is much larger than it was for this sample, where the sample size was 45 versus a sample size of only 10. Okay, so we got much more variable outcome. Good. Okay, so let's go on to the next problem. Pew Research uh, reported 45% of American adults report that they lived with one or more chronic conditions. However, this value was uh, uh, based on a sample, so it may not be a perfect estimate for the population parameter. Population parameter is the true population proportion. Our sample uh, uh, point estimate is p-cap, or our sample uh, proportion. Uh, the study reported a standard error of about 1.2%, and a normal model may be reasonably used in this setting. Create a 95% confidence interval for the proportion of U.S. adults who live with one or more chronic conditions. Okay, so they gave us a standard error here, didn't they? And they want a 95% confidence interval. And they're saying that the research said that the proportion was 0.4, was 45%, 0.45. So let's see what we know here. Okay, let's make this go away and get a fresh piece of paper. Okay, let's see what we have here. We have, okay, the proportion, p-cap, right? p-cap is our, the sample that we took, we got a result of 0.45. 0.45, that's p-cap, right? That's our estimate, that's our sample result for the proportion of Americans that, what was it, living alone or something like that? Elderly living alone, or live a chronic condition, 0.45 elderly people live a chronic condition. That's the result of our sample. But we don't know what P is. P is always going to be unknown to us. So all we know is our sample, which is a limited size sample, came out to be 0.45. But 
But they did tell us that the standard error for this sample is equal to 1.2%. Or, that's in other words, 0.012. Okay, did I get that right? Yep, 1.2%. So how can we how can we calculate a confidence, an interval of confidence for this 95% confidence interval? Well, the confidence interval is going to be equal to our p-value, right? Whatever our point estimate is, whether it's x bar or it's p cap, right? It's going to be either one of them, plus or minus, plus or minus, and for a 95% confidence interval, it's going to be plus or minus 1.96, 1.96. Times our standard error, right? If we were looking at a 99% confidence interval, we would use 2.58. We've talked about this in class before. For a 90% confidence interval, we would use 1.64, right? It'd be a narrower uh, 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 range, so we would have less confidence that we would uh, that p would be in that range. Okay, so let's take a look at this. How is this? How is this going to work out for our p value? So it's going to be 0.45 plus or minus 1.96 times 0 0.012. Okay, we'll see what that looks like when we actually calculate it. Okay, so it's going to be 0.45. I'm going to put that into memory first. Okay, uh, let's actually, let me do it this way, clear memory. I'm going to take 1.96 times 0 0.012. It's going to double it basically to point to about 2%, 2.4%. I'm going to put that into memory. And I'm going to clear that out. I'm going to take 0.45 and I'm going to subtract that value, 1.96 times 0.12. I'm going to subtract that from uh, 0.45, and it gives me 0.426, right? 0.426, let me go here and write that down, 0.426, and for the upper range, I'm going to add 1.96. Let me go back to my calculator. Okay, I'm going to clear that. I'm going to say 0.45 plus 1.96 times 0.12. And that's going to be equal to 47, 0 0.474. 0 0.474. So we may never know what the true population proportion is. But we can say with 95% confidence that the true population proportion is between these two numbers. Right? And uh, uh, but that that gives us some measure of how well we know the true population proportion. Anybody remember what this quantity here is called, right? What 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 this two and a half percent or whatever it was that we subtracted and added. What that was called, what we added and subtracted from 0.45 when we talk about it as one amount. Right? The 0 .1, 0 0.012 is a standard error. What is the 1.96 times the 0 0.012? What's that called? Anybody remember? It's got a common name, right? You know, it's like plus or minus. Oh, it's going to be, that's going to be $2 plus or minus a couple of bucks or something like that. $100 plus or minus a couple of bucks. What is that called? That's the margin of error, right? This quantity in here that we're adding and subtracting has a common name of margin of error. They were adding and subtracting the margin of error. Okay, good. All right, so let's take a look at the next, next uh, iteration of this. Um, a poll conducted in 2013 found that 52% of American Twitter users get at least some news on Twitter. The standard error for estimates was 2.4%, and the normal, this, uh, normal distribution may be used model for a proportion. Construct a 99% confidence interval for the fraction of U.S. adults who get some news on Twitter and interpret the confidence interval in that context. Okay, let's give that a try. They gave us the standard error. Right? We don't have to worry about that. That's already been given to us. So let's see how I can count, how I can figure this out. So P cap, the proportion that we believe that represents this, P cap is equal to 0.52. And our standard error 
is equal to uh, uh, is equal to point zero two four two point four percent. Okay, I'm going to put these the same in the same terms, and let's see. We want our ninety percent, ninety nine percent confidence interval. Ninety nine percent confidence interval. Okay, so how do we how would we figure this out? Okay, so we know the formula for our confidence interval is going to be p cap plus or minus our margin of error. Right? Well, that's in other words, that's p cap plus or minus. Well, wait a second. I was going to put 1.96 in here, but it's a 99% confidence interval. So for 99% confidence interval, I'm going to use 2.58. Right? I'm going to note that over here. For a 90% confidence interval, we use 1.64. For a 95% confidence interval, we use 1.96. And for a 99% confidence interval, we use 2.58. And you guys remember what the source of that was, right? We talked about in the previous class that these all came from, this is the z-score for half a percent left on the left side and half a percent left on the other side, meaning that uh, you have to be, uh, you have to be 2.58 standard deviations away from the mean to have 1% outside uh, total on the left and the right hand side of the normal distribution, or for 1.96, two and a half percent on the left, two and a half percent on the right. So the middle 95 percent is only 1.96 standard deviations to the left and the mean, the right to the mean. Similarly, with 90 percent, five percent on the left, five percent on the right, and 90 percent is between those two, uh, with a z score of minus 1.64 and positive 1.64. That's where these numbers actually came from, as you recall. When you, we did it kind of graphically. Okay, so let's figure this out. For this problem, the p cap is 0.52 plus or minus 2.58. Well, hang on a second. Times the standard error, of course. 2.58 times the standard error, which is equal to 0 0.024. Let's give this a try. Okay, so let's clear this. And let's give it a try, 2.58 times 0.024 is equal to about 6%. I'm going to clear memory. I'm going to put that into memory, clear this out. And I'm going to say, what is our point estimate? It's 0.52 minus our margin of error, 6%. Comes out to be 0.458, right? 0.4.4. Five, eight. Just drop my graphics pen, so I, I, it's going to come out a little funky. 0.58, and if I add my margin of error, I clear this. 0.52 plus my margin of error is going to be equal to 0 0.582. 0 0.582. So our 99% confidence interval is 0.58. To 0.582 between these two numbers. We're 99% sure the true population proportion for uh, uh, people that use Twitter for, for news is between 0.58 and 0.5458 and 0.582. Would my 95% confidence interval be wider or narrower? Wider or narrower than this, our 95%. You guys want to take a hit at that? Let me know what you think. Would our 90, 95 or 90 percent confidence be wider or narrower? Exactly. It would be narrower. It would be narrower for two reasons. One reason is, is because we're adding and subtracting a smaller number because we're only multiplying by 1.96. So our margin of error is smaller. So our range is going to be a bit smaller. But also, intuitively, it's going to be narrower because um, uh, if we're uh, if we're 99 percent confident, we have to have a wide range to be that sure. 95 percent, we can have a narrower range because uh, we're in, we're not requiring ourselves to be that certain that we captured the mean. And 90 percent, even narrower than that, because we're willing to accept 10 percent chance of missing the uh, mean if that if that occurs. Okay, let's move on to the next one. Okay. Okay, but I want to just do one where. I 
want to, I'm going to give you one free form one because I, I, I don't want to miss the opportunity to, to do this. And that is, I'm going to give you a hypothetical situation. Let me grab my pen. Okay, let's take this hypothetical situation. I'm going to take a uh, sample of a thousand. I'm going to, let's see. Oops, wrong side. Take my sample size is going to be a thousand. Take a sample. I'm going to survey a thousand students, and I'm going to ask them how many students. Um, uh, 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 how many students took a preparatory course for the uh, for the GREs? Took some sort of preparatory course for the GREs, and out of the thousand students, uh, uh, three hundred students say yes, and seven hundred students say no. So, what is our P cap? What proportion of students say that they took a preparatory course for the GREs? Well, it's going to be equal to three hundred over a thousand, right? In other words, thirty percent, right, or point three zero is our PCAP, our proportion of students that took the exam, uh, uh, a thousand sample of a thousand students, uh, um, uh, uh, is 30%. Well, let's say what we really want to know is the P for the entire nation, for all, all 200,000 students that might have, uh, that, that were going to graduate school and took the GREs, what proportion of them, uh, assuming that this is a random sample from this population. What proportion of those 200,000 students, a p-value, what proportion took a prep course? Well, we know that 1,000 we looked at, 30% of them took a prep course. But we don't know the total population. We don't, you know, there's no way for us to know that. It won't, you know, we don't have the resources to ask all 200,000, only 1,000 that we surveyed. Okay, so in order to figure this out, I can't, I can't, I won't ever know P, but at least maybe I can know have a, a range in which I can be confident I know that P exists in. So I'm going to say 95% confidence is good enough for me. I want a 95% confidence interval. So what is that going to be? It's going to be equal to P cap plus or minus the margin of error. And what is the margin of error? It's going to be P cap plus or minus 1.96 times the standard error. Okay, now up until this point, the textbook has given you the standard error. Okay, in this case, when well, we haven't been given the standard error, we're going to have to calculate it for ourselves. So the standard error for a proportion is going to be equal to the square root of P times 1 minus P over N. Okay, so notice we don't know P, so the only thing we can use here is P cap. So the square root of Square root of 0.3 times 0.7, right? 1 minus 0.3 is 0.7, over our sample size of 1,000. That's what our standard error is going to be. Let's calculate that using our calculator. Okay, so I'm going to clear memory, and clear there. And I'm going to say, let's see, 0.3 times 0.7 equals this divided by a thousand. I gotta correct that over there. Let me finish, forget to correct that over there. Is equal to that number. Now I'm gonna find, take the square root of that whole quantity, everything underneath there after I've resolved it, find the square root of. So that's gonna be equal to 0 0.014, so on and so forth. So that's my standard error. So I'm going to store that in memory. Let's see. Okay, I'm going to store that in memory, and I'm going to clear that out. So I have that stored away. Okay, so let me just go over here and correct. Let's add that zero. So um, uh, let me bring that back again. Whoops. Bring that back again. So what was that again? That was 0 0.145. 0 0.0145. 0.0145. Okay, so now let's calculate our margin of error. So, or actually the entire thing here. So it's 0 0.30, 0 0.0145, 0 0.0145, 0 0.0145, 0 0.0145, 0 0.0145, 0 0.0145, 0 0.0145, 0 0.0145, 0 0.0145, 0 0
plus or minus 1.96 times 0.0145. So now I'm going to calculate my margin of error. Okay, here is our standard error. So I'm going to multiply that by 1.96 times 1.96. Here's our margin of error. I'm going to clear memory and I'm going to store this in memory. Okay, there, good. So that's in memory. So it's actually about 3%. So our margin of error is about 3%. So we're going to take 0 0.30 and then subtract approximately 3%. So right away I can see my confidence interval is going to be somewhere between 27% and 33%. Okay, but let's actually work this out a little bit more precisely using the calculator. So I'm going to go here and I'm going to say, uh, I'm going to clear this, and I'm going to say, let's see, 0 0.30 minus, I'll recall this, and this comes out to 27.2%. 0 0.272. 0.272, comma, and the upper limit for our confidence interval is going to be, and this time I'm going to clear that out, and I'm going to start with 30%, 0 0.30, and I'm going to add my margin of error, and that's going to be equal to 32.8, 32 32.8, 32 0.328, okay, so between 27.2 and 32.8%, of the population uh, of college students took the uh, nationwide took the uh, 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 prep took a prep course for the GREs. Do I know that for sure? No, I only know that the true population proportion is between these two values with 95 percent certainty, right? On 95 percent confidence interval. Okay, good. So let's take another five minute break while. I uh, take a sip of something over here so I don't lose my, my voice. Okay, we'll come back and we'll finish up in the next 10 or 15 minutes. We're going to pause the recording again. I just had a whole conversation with you guys that you didn't hear because I didn't turn my uh, speaker back on. Okay, so so um, uh, you can hear it next time, I guess. What I started to say was I, I purposely started with the confidence interval for proportions because most students find that more intimidating or, or uh, hard to understand than calculating confidence intervals for means you know, numerical means, okay? But it really works exactly the same way, except the, the, that little difference in calculating the standard error. For mean, use sigma over the square root of n. For a proportion, use the square root of p times one minus p over n. Okay, so let's take a look at uh, doing it for a mean now, a more common application. 2009 holiday retail season, which kicked off on November 7th, uh, uh, now it probably kicks off. It's Christmas season now. Probably kicks off. I think in about a month, right? Have been marked by somewhat lower self-reported consumer spending seen during comparable period. Uh, to get an estimate of consumer spending, 436 randomly sampled American adults were sampled. Uh, daily consumer spending for the six-day period after Thanksgiving, spanning Black Friday, blah, blah, blah. so many averaged eighty-seven dollars and uh, eighty-four dollars and seventy-one cents, eighty-four point seven one. 95% confidence interval based on this sample is 80.31 to 80.91. They've, they've calculated this for you. 
determine the following statements are true or false. Okay, we're 95% confident that the average spending of these 430 uh, adults is between those two numbers. Is that true or false? What do you guys think? Well, that's false, right? The, you know, we're 95% confident the true mean for all Americans during that period was between these two numbers, not just for the, the people in this sample. We know what the difference is in this particular sample, and it's sigma, not the and sigma not affected by the standard error. The sample size doesn't affect that, right? So we, we, that, that's not really true. That describes the sample, but the confidence interval sub, uh, describes our estimate for the mean for the entire population, not the sample. Confidence interval is not valid since the distribution of spending in the sample is right skewed. See, it's a little right skewed here. What was the sample size? Sample size was 436. Well, didn't we say that if we have a large sample size, like a large sample size the, the, defined as, you know, bigger than 30, have a big sample size, well, the sample distribution is likely to be normally distributed. So we don't have to worry about having a slightly skewed normal distribution for the population. So uh, uh, we, we're going to say false to be as well. 95% of random samples have a sample mean between uh, 80.31 and 89.11. Again, the real definition is comparing it to the population mean. The true population mean, uh, where 95% certain true population mean lies between those two, those two, and uh, not 95% uh, uh, of the time we will be right in making that prediction. That's what that tells us. Uh, we're 95% sure the average spending of all Americans is between those two numbers. No, that's the population mean is between those two numbers. The 95% uh, could be a much broader uh, range for uh, uh, all. Uh, that's the population range of 95%. That's going to be much wider. 90% confidence interval would be narrower than 90% confidence interval since we don't need to be sure as, as sure about those estimates. That's true. We know that from before. In order to decrease, decrease the margin of error, uh, 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 a 95% confidence interval to a third of what it is now, we would need a sample size three times larger. Hmm, that's an interesting question. What would we need to decrease the margin of error to a range that's one third of what is it is? How big? How much bigger a sample would we need? Well, we would need the margin of error to be three times smaller, right? In order to have it uh, 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 to, to uh, make the range one third of what it is now. Well, gee, you know, that wouldn't, let me think about this. Let's think about this. Okay, so we want to make our margin of error smaller. So what is our margin of error equal to? Our margin of error is equal to 1.96 times our standard error. Well, this is not going to change because it's going to be a 95% confidence interval. But we want that, we want this margin of error to be one-third the size that it started out as. So what's the standard error equal to? Standard error is equal to sigma over the square root of the sample size. Sigma over the square root of the sample size. Well, we want this to be one-third as big. Well, if we want this number to be one-third as big, the sample size has to be nine times as big, right? Because we're going to take the square root of the sample size. So if we want, if we want uh, 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 this to be three times larger, this to be three times larger, then n has to be nine times larger. Because when we take its square root, that nine times larger is going to just be dividing this by three times as big a number. So the sample size has to be nine times as large to make the, the margin of error one third the size, okay? Because we need that to be a bigger number. Okay, so I'm going to give you one example of this from the what we just read here. I'm going to tell you that the margin of error, let's see. I'm going to tell you that um, uh, we sample 255 Hunter students. And we asked them how much they spent on textbooks this semester. And the average X bar 
the average amount they spent on textbooks this semester was $382 with a standard deviation, right, of standard deviation of, um, 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 of uh, 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 say, $100. Okay, $100. Okay, so I'm looking at this. I'm saying to myself, you know, we've been using Sigma up to this time, right? We're using Sigma. I don't see Sigma here. Nobody's giving me Sigma. They've only given me the standard deviation of the population. Well, let's make believe that this is equal to Sigma. Okay? We're going to make believe that our standard deviation from our sample is the same thing as Sigma. It approximates it. You know, it's, it, that's a pretty, pretty good guess, especially with a large sample size. But let's say that, uh, that we're going to use this as Sigma, even though we don't know the population standard deviation, just like we don't know the population mean. So we're going to use the population the sample standard deviation as sigma. So now I need to know, let's say, in order to calculate my confidence interval, I'm going to use x bar, plus or minus, say we're 95% confidence interval we were interested in, plus or minus 1.96 times our standard error. What's our standard error going to be? Our standard error is going to be equal to sigma over the square root of n, sample size, and what is our sample size? Let's see. Sigma is 100. Why is it 100? Well, because we don't have the population standard deviation. But I'm going to use the sample standard deviation. I'm going to justify that by saying it's a very large sample. So I'm going to call that 100 over the sample size. Square root of sample size. Sample size is 255. Square root of 255. So x bar plus or minus 1.96 times 100 over the square root of 255. Okay, so let's go ahead and calculate that. Oops. Get that off of there so I can get my pen back. Okay, so I'm going to get my calculator up. Okay, all clear. I'm going to clear up my memory. The first thing I'm going to do is find out what the 2 square root of 255 is. 255. Square root of 255 is 15.96. I'm going to put that into memory. And I'm going to clear this. So then I'm going to divide that into 100. 100 divided by the square root of 255 is equal to 6.26. That's our standard error. Our standard error is 6.26. 100 divided by the square root of 255. I'm going to clear memory. I'm going to stick that into memory now. Okay. So now I'm going to multiply that by 1.96. I'm going to say 1.96 times our standard error is equal to 12.27. So this entire thing, our margin of error, is equal to 12.27. I'm going to clear memory again. I'm going to stick that into memory. Now our margin of error is in memory now. I'm going to clear the register here. So I'm going to add and subtract that to our X bar, our sample mean, which was $382. 382 minus our margin of error is equal to 369 and 73. 369.73. And the upper limit of our margin of error is going to be I'm going to clear this, and I'm going to get $382 plus our margin of error, okay, which is going to be 394.27. 394.27. Okay, so what do we have here? We're 95% sure that the true average for all Hunter students for how much they spent on textbook. And there are a lot of Hunter students, right? Aren't there, aren't, isn't the student body at Hunter, like counting undergraduates and graduates, and stuff? isn't there like 20,000 students or something like that, right? We couldn't sample all of them, but we did sample 255. So the true population mean for all 20,000 students is between $369 and $394 that they spent on books. That's, the, that's our 95% confidence interval for the true mean 
In other words, we think when 95% sure the true mean average for all Hunter students is within those two. Of course, the range of actual amounts that different students uh, spent is going to be enormous, much wider than this. Could be anywhere from $20, like you guys using the open source textbook, getting a printout, to $1,000. So students taking courses that each course might, five courses that each course might have a $200 textbook or something like that. So the population range is much wider than the uh, uh, our confidence interval for the actual mean. Here, we're only predicting what the mean is. And this range represents a range in which we can be 95% sure that the true mean lies. Okay, and again, if we want to be 99% sure, we just change this to 2.58. If we want to be 90% 90, 90 sure, we just change this to 1.64. Okay, so I think, I think uh, we should be in pretty good shape. I hope that helped with this portion of the course. On Wednesday, when we're in person, I'll back up a bit and I'll go through some of the earlier material, some of the earlier material we were working on, so that we're going to be, I think, in pretty good shape for starting the second part of this course. We're only about a third of the way through, right? We'll be starting this, this the second third of this course, and and second third of this course depends on this uh, this kind of understanding of uh, sampling and distribution of samples quite a bit. So this will help us out. Understanding this will help us out in the next third of the course.